Hello and welcome to the first in our Corporate Institute video lecture series. I'm Yvonne Sue Turner, Senior Manager of Corporate Resources and Programs at the Points of Light Corporate Institute. Through the series, our goal is to share the latest trends and research on corporate volunteering and social impact. Our videos will feature experts and leaders in CSR and corporate service who are part of the Corporate Institute's leadership faculty. The Corporate Institute is the go-to resource for community-minded companies looking to build and expand effective employee volunteer programs and as part of Points of Light, the world's largest organization dedicated to volunteer service. On today's video, we'll hear from B. Bocalandro, president of Bureau Works. B. will talk to us about job purposing, a new management practice of broadening the social mission of corporate jobs with the opportunity to serve societal causes. We know that integrating purpose into business is a hot topic these days, especially because research says that organizations with more engaged employees are 22% more profitable than those with disengaged workers, according to Gallup. So B, tell us about job purposing. Thanks, Yvonne. I would be thrilled to talk about job purposing. So um, let me pull up some uh, visual aids here so you don't have to look at my face the whole time, save you from that. Uh, that dastardly uh, experience. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing a, um, a slide in front of you um, and um, with the title of today's session. Um, so, and please note the contact information. Of course, this is the beginning of a conversation. We don't expect that, you know, we're going to say everything there is to say about anything, um, including job purposing. So, I'm going to start by asking you, imagine an all-natural supplement, and this supplement, um, it's, uh, it's, it's also affordable, by the way, but it, um, it helps you become happier and have fewer um, incidents of depression if you're prone to that. And if you, if you suffer from chronic pain, you go, whoa, um, my pain went down from an 8 to a 5 in level of intensity. And um, also, if um, it, it increases your T cell count so that your immune system is stronger. This is an all-natural supplement, and you report being happier. So does this exist? Anybody? And by the way, it also makes it less likely that you die. So all-natural, very affordable supplement, does, this, does it exist? So if you're listening to this, you probably suspect that it does, and it's called volunteering. So on all these things, uh, there is evidence, academic evidence, um, and uh, elsewhere, but certainly rigorous academic evidence from Cornell University, from Harvard, from um, Brandeis University, from NIH, showing that when people do what scientists call pro-social behavior, which is to do something to help others, the selfless behaviors, we actually benefit in this way. We're happier. Um, they actually um, hooked people up uh, to, um, to monitors, and they know that your immune system actually improves when even just by thinking of doing something good for somebody else. But don't just think about it. Go ahead and do it. <laughs> um, so, okay. So this is established out there, and it's, we've heard of the helpers high. Um, but you manage people at work. I mean, what can you do about this? You know, what does this have to do with you, right? Well, you know, work might be kind of stiffer and a little bit more sterile than the places where we volunteer and we do all these good things. Um, but it's still filled with the same species, humans, the same species that when uh, we do a volunteer activity, we get happier, healthier, more energetic, we live longer, um, all of those things. So, as you would expect, even in the workplace, these things happen, right? And more importantly for managers is that we're learning now that when employees volunteer, um, they are more productive, they're more engaged in work. So, Yvonne talked about the disengagement in work and how much it costs companies according to Gallup. So employees are more likely to be engaged. They're more likely to, uh, to stay around. But 
it's not all volunteering that does this. Now, I should say that almost all volunteering does the make people happier, healthier, all of that. That's been well established. But when it comes to the workplace, it has to be volunteering that materially changes the experience for that worker. So if, an, if a worker goes to their PTA on a Thursday afternoon and volunteers there, they're going to be happier and healthier and all those things. But on the next day, Friday morning, when they show up at work, their relationship to their employer is the same. Their pride in their work is the same. That hasn't changed. So their productivity is not going to be any higher. Their engagement probably is not going to experience any lift. They're not going to have a stronger connection to their co coworkers. So when it comes to the employer benefits of volunteering, it takes a specific type of volunteering to generate these types of benefits, the higher productivity, the engagement, the work performance, the retention. So what is that? Well, that's the job purposing that Yvonne talked about. So job purposing is really a management practice of taking the job and broadening the social mission, pushing it out so that it's doing good things out there for the world. And it does improve these, these workplace behaviors, right? So engagement, retention, all of those things. The interesting thing is that if you take two workers, right? So one's disengaged and one's engaged. And you look at them, well, let's say you take two groups of workers, 100 disengaged workers and 100 engaged workers. Um, the disengaged workers, one of the things that they, they, they lack is purpose, right? And the engaged, they have purpose. So this is the hard evidence that a purpose job does boost engagement in the way that Yvonne talked about earlier. The interesting thing is that it happens at a primal level. It, it's not something that the disengaged worker here in the, on the left has any consciousness of. They're not thinking, well, I know why that guy over there is much more engaged than I am because he, you know, has a purpose job, which means that, you know, volunteering is incorporated into his everyday job, and I don't. So um, that's what's going on. He's much more likely to think what's on the slide, which is like, what the heck? Why is this guy so much happier, more productive than I am? He must be doping. Like, there, he's got some unfair advantage here. We are not aware of the powerful effect that volunteering has on our workplace performance. So the way Franz de Waal put it, and he's a primatologist, is this way. We are pre-programmed to reach out. Empathy is an automated response over which we have limited control. We can suppress it, mentally block it, or fail to act on it. But except for a tiny percentage of the population known as psychopaths, no one is immune to another situation. So what this means is that this is so hardwired in us that unless you know, your team is filled with psychopaths, when you offer them the opportunity to volunteer through work, to do this job purposing, it will be an automated response for their engagement to go up. And why is this? So the reason is that we have evolved. Evolution has made sure that this is true for us. Um, we have evolved this way. So as, as solo beings, we are pathetic, us humans, right? I mean, we can't bring down a woolly mammoth. We can't even, we can't keep one eye open like ducks do and sleep. We need somebody watching the, you know, the cave to make sure that nothing comes in in the middle of the night. We need to take turns. We need to be clustered together in groups to survive and to thrive. And so what evolution has done is to ensure that we stick together and that we don't go off and try to lead solo lives is that evolution has ensured that we get rewarded when we do good things for others. And it's called the helper's high. And it's, it's not some, you know, hippie California um, uh, concept. This is a physiological effect. So our brains actually secrete endorphins when we um, 
participate in that workplace volunteer program. And again, we are not conscious of this. We have no idea why we feel happier. Well, you might, since you're listening to this, but you, most people have no idea why they're happier. So this is an established um, phenomenon that is happening in our brains, in our bodies, all the time. Um, Franz de Waal's book, The Age of Empathy, he actually has several, but The Age of Empathy is my favorite, um, is there. There's also management people, um, people like Adam Grant, who works at Wharton. You know, this is a business school. And he is saying that pro-social behavior or um, doing good for others um, drives success in people. Happy Money is a professor at uh, Harvard, Michael Norton. And he has one chapter in there is around how doing good for others makes us happier. And then the Daniel Pink book um, is, it's almost, it's the other side of the co coin. What he proves in his book is that what we thought made people more, more motivated at work, which is like to give them big bonuses and big, you know, all these extrinsic rewards and great offices doesn't work. And that what we, one of the things that we need at work is purpose. So Yvonne was absolutely right uh, when she said earlier that, you know, this is a hot topic now. Um, and two of these books are New York Times bestsellers, Give and Take and Drive. And the other two are fantastic books, and maybe um, they will become bestsellers. So could it be this simple? You take a disengaged employee, you give them a purpose job, and I realize that the definition of purpose job is still a little vague here. It's just a certain type of volunteering. But... Um, just hang with me for a little while. You, you, you change their job in a way so that they're kind of volunteering as part of the job and they become engaged. Well, let's look at some examples. So HP, for example, they have salespeople. That's the job, right? And you go to a small business and you sell them a cloud solution or a printer, right? Um, and so um, what they allow their employees to do is to sign up to become eco-advocates. This is voluntary, but what you can do is that you, there's a, a really sophisticated training program that starts with very simple um, modules that you can watch online on how to reduce the carbon footprint and otherwise help a business be more sustainable because HP is fantastic at this. They, they, have, been, they have been leaders in this forever, so why not share this with their salespeople so that their salespeople can then share it with HP business customers. So now when an HP salesperson goes to sell that cloud solution to that you know, bagel store, um, they can, can tell them, hey, you know, we're thrilled to help you with your technology, but did you know that we could also help reduce your carbon footprint and your solid waste and your water use and your electricity use? And by the way, this will reduce the cost. So now their job is different. They're not just selling a cloud solution. They are helping the environment every time they go and they do a sales call. This is a purpose job. So does it work? Does it actually um, improve engagement and morale? Yes, absolutely. HP has data that it does this. So let's take a completely different job. How do you purpose that? Let's say that you, uh, you know, uh, you have uh, you manage a staff that cleans hotel rooms. Well, what does Caesar's Entertainment do? So they tell their housekeeping staff. They say hey, you know, people just use a little bit of soap when they stay with us. If you take the unused bar of soap, we will send it to clean the world. Uh, this is a nonprofit. And they will sterilize it, and they will put it in the hands of families that, um, that are at risk of uh, dying from preventable diseases. And so now when this housekeeper goes to their job every morning, they're not just scrubbing a tub. They are helping the world reduce the number of children who die from preventable diseases every day, which tragically right now is at 8,000. This is a purpose job.
And, and Caesars Entertainment has data showing that engagement is higher for employees that participate in these types of programs as well. Let's take a different job. Let's say that you go door to door and you sell cosmetics. So how do you purpose that? Well, Avon has been doing this for a very long time. They are pioneers really in purpose jobs because they thought, you know what? Um, we help women with beauty. That's where they started, right? And then they realized, you know, there are the the medical community isn't doing a great job at helping at helping women understand the importance of um, of preventive actions in terms of breast cancer. So we can do that because we have very intimate conversations with women I and mean, we talk to them about you know they don't like the way their chin looks and and so we have this opportunity to make that conversation one about health and so if you're an Avon uh, representative if you want you can you can get information out there to the women that you're selling to around how to prevent breast cancer and of course we all know this right I mean the color pink has a whole new meaning because of um, the breast cancer crusade and really if there's one organization that has done the lion's share to make breast cancer an absolute well-known cause out there it's Avon so it's possible to take to have a purpose job really uh, change the landscape of a cause out there and um, so did this work for them yes their retention went way up once there's these jobs were purposed so here's three different examples three different jobs um, and an example of purposing it um, there's evidence from again people within the field of management showing that you know this isn't a nutty thing to do this type of engagement in the corporate world into corp into social causes makes sense for business um, for example Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School and there's research from the corporate executive board company from Rutgers from Deloitte again um, supporting this case as well so just a couple of things if you've noticed it's not just any volunteering right this isn't just your mother's typical way of volunteering these are kind of um, different ways of volunteering because they meet these very specific drivers uh, one is that it's folded into the work it's work native two it's kind of evolving or fresh right so employees need to feel like they're doing more than they do on their own it works much better if you want that bounce and engagement that increase in retention all those workplace things for the volunteering to be group based it works much better if employees know the good that they have done so if they have a sense if they have that child in front of them that just learned to read that's better than if they don't or if at least they get um, they get a follow-up on what happened to that child um, so if it's impact evident um, it works much better it's best to keep it volunteering although don't shy away if you're a manager from saying hey what if we all you know um, take on a cause this fall and help with that um, so you can be heavy-handed but don't completely corner people into <laughs> volunteering so keep it voluntary that helps the interesting thing is that even if it's not voluntary you'll still get the bounce and engagement it just won't be as high um, and then let employees have some say in it let them design what it is that you do so you know in the HP case you know the salespeople really had a lot to say about what the eco advocates ended up being for example so um, let them put their own mark on what the purposing in the job is so um, that's job purposing in a nutshell very very quickly um, of course is the beginning of the conversation um, I do have a blog on this and you're welcome to go to it it's at bbocalandro.com and then points of light has tons of great information on how you can bring in volunteering into the workplace that can help you as well so 
um, and you know just go to pointsoflight.org. Um, let me just uh, end with one closing thought. So there was this man a few decades back and he interviewed 130 workers, in-depth interviews, and here's an excerpt of his summary. He said, work is about a search for daily bread, for cash, in short, a sort of Monday through Friday sort of dying. Fortunately, this is only half the story, the dark side of his conclusion after interviewing these 130 plus people. Before I tell you the brighter side of his conclusion, let me just reiterate what it is that Yvonne said early on, and that is that the majority of workers are disengaged, so they are here. They are just working for their daily bread, for their cash. They, that's, that's what it is for them. It's a transaction. They are disengaged. They are mired in this dread right now. So Gallup says three out of four workers globally are here. So maybe this isn't half the story, maybe this is mo the majority of the story. Still, what completes the conclusion that, um, that this man reached around our work? So this is the complete quote. Work is about a search for daily purpose as well as daily bread, for recognition as well as cash, for astonishment rather than torpor. In short, for a sort of life rather than a Monday through Friday sort of dying. And yes, the man who did these interviews is not just anybody, it's Studs Terkel. So this is the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, oral historian and author who said this. So those we manage were kids at some point who likely said something like, when I grow up, I want to be a pilot or a sales rep or a scientist. However they ended that sentence, they beamed with pride for the worker they would become. Regardless of how they feel about their job today, you can job purpose you can make their childhood dream come true. Thank you. And I will turn it back to you, Yvonne. Great, thank you so much, B, for that wonderful presentation and what an inspiring uh, end at the at the end there. I have a couple questions for you. So we've uh, we've heard a lot about millennials and we've seen a lot of research about millennials and engaging in work and how millennials are really driven uh, by this search for purpose. And I'm wondering how can how does job purposing apply to all the generations? Yeah, well, um, job purposing applies to millennials better than anybody else because. I think we're all millennials, <laughs> actually, in that we all expect more from life than just a job. But unfortunately, the rest of us, a lot of the rest of us, have that like more um, buried underneath other things. So millennials, I think, are the one. In a sense, they're just being more authentic to this true core. Um, and I, I will say that. Um, there is a so I teach at Georgetown, right? And that's overwhelmingly millennials in my classroom. And they're a little bit like, duh, well, of course, like, why haven't we been job purposing? Really? Like, you guys didn't have this when you were, you know, when you started your jobs? Like, they expect this. They expect that whatever job they had, even if, if, if what they wanted to do was to design dresses. And um, and they end up working for a fashion designer. They 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 expect that that job will matter in a bigger way than just ending having a dress end up in a high end store. They have this expectation more naturally. I think they're just more in touch with um, kind of an ancient yearning in all humans. And the rest of us have kind of lost touch with that. And there's lots of evidence, as you know, showing that millennials are demanding this. Yeah. And uh, what is uh, one concrete next step that managers at companies can take to implement job purposing in, in their workforce? Well, um, I would suggest looking at 
so most companies have some sort of support for employee volunteering and looking in your company to see what is out there already and then um, remember that it should meet those drivers which spell out we give right um, and if you don't if you didn't remember them <laughs> from this video again um, th there is more uh, more information on this um, in my blog bbocalandro.com but um, so you you look for what the company already offers so they might have uh, a signature program that goes into clinics or they might actually give grants for team projects and so you can use that grant to then design job purposing for your team um, the one thing I would I would say is that remember that not all all volunteering is great so if you just get your team to volunteer that's fantastic but if you want it to be job purposing because you really wanted to improve their engagement um, don't feel shy about modifying what it is that the company already does so that it is more job purposing so if it isn't let's say they have a board service program and that's that that would be a great thing for your team because you have a very high-end team um, use the board service program that your company has but that's not a team event so turn it into a team event have it you know um, have lunches where people talk about their their board experience and so it has that esprit de court to it so that it, it, it does result in the higher engagement and retention and all those workplace benefits. Great. Well, thank you very much, Bede, uh, for speaking on our first video lecture. Uh, to access more resources and consulting services to help your company build its employee volunteer program, visit our website at www.pointsoflight.org and click the Four Companies tab at the top. And please stay tuned for the next video in our series where we'll talk about how to organize a hackathon. Until next time. Oh, that sounds great, Yvonne. I'll be there. <laughs>